Well, welcome to the Truth and Precept channel. Today we're going to be looking at Isaiah 5. Now, I know that I could say this probably about every chapter in Isaiah, but I believe this is going to be one of those chapters that is critical for all of us to understand. And and that's because it's prophecies uh, that will that it uh, that it gives here is what will have happened to the Lord's vineyard in the last days. And it also tells us what type of leaders are running the vineyard and that, that they're running it under falsehood. So this is important because if we exercise faith in Isaiah's words, it will, one, it will wake us up out of spiritual sleep. Two, we'll start to realize that all is not well in Zion. And three, that we really have removed ourselves more than we know from Jesus Christ without knowing it, right? And so with that, let's get started uh, with Isaiah 5. So as a summary of what we're going to see here, the Lord's servants have allowed the enemy to break into the Lord's vineyard, and the people accept the enemies as their leaders. It's kind of just kind of a paradox, right? Um, because they are taught the philosophies of men, they, the people, are taught the philosophies of men mingled with scripture, they stumble and begin to confuse good from evil and inherit covenant curses. The Lord's left hand, the modern-day king of Assyria, whoever that's going to be in our day, right, he destroys the wicked, including those of the Lord's covenant people who will not repent and return to God. And as we start here, right, as we study Isaiah, why, you know, why am I doing such an emphasis on Isaiah? It's because it is a commandment of Jesus Christ, right, that we need to study, not just read his words, but we need to study so that we understand. And why? Well, because as he spoke here in 3 Nephi chapter 23, right, just as Isaiah spoke towards ancient Israel, he also speaks towards the Latter-day Gentiles, and that all his words have been and shall be. Right? They're going to happen again to us, and so we need to understand. This is why it's a commandment, because if we don't understand the words of Isaiah, we're not going to be prepared for the days ahead. So chapter 5, verse 1, and Zion needs to be redeemed. So now I will sing a song, sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved touching his vineyard. My well-beloved hath a vineyard in a very fruitful hill. And so Isaiah is starting out with, a, he's going to, this is going to be a song he's, that he's composing here in chapter 5 and singing about Christ and, you know, this this fruitful hill, right? This is Mount Zion, right? We are now... As I go through each of these slides, you're also, I'm going to lace uh, other cross-references that are speaking about the similar events. So we'll see things about, you know, the Lord's fields where he's growing wheat, he's planted wheat, and tares are sowed in it. We're going to see the a vineyard where grapes are grown. We're going to see a vineyard where olive trees are grown. They're all the same thing, right? They're just maybe different aspects, maybe different lessons that we can glean, but they're talking about the same event. And so you're going to see that here with, for example, Isaiah 5 here, and I'm going to reference DNC 101. Uh, you know, it's called the parable of the element, the nobleman and the olive trees, or and or the redemption of Zion, and then also. JST Matthew 13, DNC 86, uh, JST Matthew 21. So we're going to see, you know, we're going to take all these pieces and really put them together to see what the scriptures are telling us. And this is one of the key ways to not being deceived in the last days. Right? This is what we are taught in Doctrine and Covenants, section 52, verse 14, right? That Christ has given us patterns 
in the scriptures that we need to put together so that we're not deceived, right? Because it is there's deception all over this world, and it is really hard uh, to sort, right? What is truth and what is error? Who is good? Who is bad? And so we need we need to rely on the scriptures, right? That iron rod, you know, that Lehi talks about in his vision of tree of life. And so that's what I hope to do is present these patterns to you. Now you can go, you know, I definitely invite you to go pray about these, right? Because you should not trust anyone, including myself, right? You can learn from other people, um, but we need to get confirmation that is such an important thing. We need to get confirmation through the Spirit uh, about what is true. Okay, so so we're going to learn about a vineyard. And Doctrine and Covenants 101, And now I will show unto you a parable, that you may know my will concerning the redemption of Zion. Right, and so this parable that we're going to cover pretty extensively here in Doctrine and Covenants 101, Right, it tells us that we're going to learn that Zion would start to be established during Joseph Smith's time, but that the enemy breaks in to this vineyard and they take over the vineyard. Right? And then lastly, because of that, Zion needs to be redeemed. It needs to be rescued and reestablished. JST Matthew 13, verse 24 Another parable he put forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man who sowed good seed in his field. And Doctrine and Covenants 86.2 Behold, verily I say unto you, the field was the world, and the apostles were the sowers of the seed. Okay. So as we start thinking about all these uh, different pieces in the, the interpretations of, you know, of, of those various parts, it should start to become clear. Uh, what all these all these uh, examples are telling us. Verse 2 of Isaiah 5, And he fenced it, and gathered out the stones thereof, and planted it with, choice, with the choicest vine, and built a tower in the midst of it, and also made a winepress therein. He looked that it should bring forth grapes, and it brought forth wild grapes. Right, so the Lord's intent of this vineyard was right was to grow good grapes, but what happened, right, it did not. And so the vineyard, um, right, Christ removes the common stones, which represent uh, a lower spiritual level of people, right, generally those of Babylon, those who are wicked, choicest vines. Right? He planted it with choices vines. He started this vineyard off with the very elect, right? those who are very, the very chosen. Uh, a watchtower, as we'll see, we'll get into this more, represents uh, spiritual ascension, to be able to ascend up you know, you know, in a tower physically, but spiritually as well, so that you can, you can uh, see. Um, grapes right, are is the fruit, right? That is the result of people's efforts, and the wine press that he places there, right, applies the experiences, also the pressure to juice the grapes to get wine. So instead of leadership taking care of the vineyard that we can derive here, it was neglected, right? It produced wild grapes, which are good for nothing. Now over to DNC 101, verse 44. A certain nobleman had a spot of land, very choice. And he said unto his servants, right, Go ye unto my vineyard, even upon this very choice piece of land, and plant twelve olive trees. So now instead of grapes, we're getting olive trees. And so the nobleman is Christ. Choice land is North America, as as a cross reference with Ether chapter two, verse nine through twelve. The servants, right? This is Joseph Smith, obviously. This is also the first laborers, right? That uh, are established, which would include, um, you know, 
you know, the first presidency, the 12 apostles, uh, you know, those leaders. The vineyard is the house of Israel, right? And those 12 olive trees represents each tribe of the house of Israel. And continue with DNC 101, and set watchmen round about them, right? He set the watchmen around about the olive trees and build a tower. So he's they're getting a commandment to go build a tower that one may overlook the land round about to be a watchman upon the tower that my olive trees may not be broken down when the enemy shall come to spoil and take upon themselves the fruit of my vineyard. Okay. So the the Lord has given us a, uh, a prelude here to what's going to happen. Right. The Lord warns us often because that warning is going to happen. So the tower, right, allows, you know, as you as you think about this, you're up high, you're able to see a great distance. And so the purpose of this is, right, for for someone who's going to become a watchman, right, to to have those experiences to ascend higher that allows them to be able to give a true warning um, you know because they have eyes to see now to see the distance they can they have discernment they can get revelation right and the spirit of the lord is with them and so these watchmen you know are prophets and seers right and so numbers 11:29 and Moses said unto him would god that all his people all the Lord's people were prophets, and that the Lord would put his spirit upon them. Right? God desires that each of us can become, become a watchman, to become this type of person, to have those ascension experiences. And DNC 101, verse 12, And in that day all who are found upon the watchtower, or in other words, all mine Israel, shall be saved. Right. We all need to to get on the watchtower. And so once again, the fruit is the result of effort. Fruit becomes good, right? It, it's it's not, uh, how do we say, it's not wild, right? The or, or rotten. The fruit becomes good by repenting and receiving the baptism, all three of the water, fire, and the Holy Ghost. You can find that in 2 Nephi chapter 31, verses 17 and 18. Continuing with DNC 101. Now the servants of the noblemen, right, the servants of Christ, went and did as their Lord commanded them, and planted the olive trees, and built a hedge right, around about, and set watchmen, and began to build a tower. So the tower doesn't exist yet. They've they've just they just have a hedge built around the olive trees, so and they've set watchmen upon that hedge. So a hedge can be helpful, uh, not near as good as a tower though. And while they were yet laying the foundation right, of the tower, they began to say among themselves, right. So this is the the servants. Yeah, what need hath my lord of this tower? So the servants right, who communicated with the Lord of the vineyard are responsible for establishing a good vineyard and training watchmen to be able to discern and see with revelation. But the servants have neglected their responsibilities to complete the tower, right, to be able to reach that level of ascension that all of us need to learn how to do. And consulted for a long time, saying among themselves, What need hath my lord of this tower, seeing it is a time of peace? Right? The servants think, right, it's a time of peace. All is well in Zion. Right? That's the same thing. So they do not desire, or they do not see a need, to build a tower at this time. Continuing in verse 49, Might not this money be given to the exchangers, for there is no need of these things. So these servants aren't looking too good, right? Uh, 
Uh, they're not fulfilling the Lord's commandments. And the servants have been, they're focused on gaining wealth. Right? The money represents an investment, right, of their work and efforts and dedication. So instead of investing their time and effort in building a tower, in, in ascending, right, they have invested their time and energy with the exchangers of Babylon. Do we not see that today? And while they were at variance one with another, they became very slothful, and they hearkened not unto the commandments of the Lord. Right? And so the servants contend to begin to contend one with another in disagreement, and they ne neglect the Lord's commands concerning the vineyard. Uh, JST thir Matthew 13, verse 25. But while he slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. Right? In D&C 86.3, And after they had fallen asleep, the great persecutor of the church, the apostate, the whore, even Babylon, that maketh all nations to drink of her cup, in whose heart the enemy, even Satan, sitteth to reign. Behold, he soweth the tares. Wherefore, the tares choke the wheat and drive the church into the wilderness. So, the right the servants they start dealing with Babylon, the exchangers, right, and and that lets in, that lets the enemy in, right. That starts to plant the tares, the seeds, right, and they've fallen asleep, the servants. Right? They're not, the opposite of sleeping is, right, awake. They're not awake. They don't realize what's going on. And so, let's go back to Isaiah, uh, verse 3 and 4. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah. So, so remember, we got to apply this to ourselves so we could say, you know, as members of the church, O inhabitants of Salt Lake City, Right, the men of Utah, I will say, judge, I pray you, between me and my vineyard. What could have been done more to my vineyard that I have not done in it? Wherefore, when I looked that it should bring forth grapes, brought it forth wild grapes? Right, so the nobleman, the owner of the vineyard, he shows up and he's going to have an accountability conversation. Right? And he says, remember what the vineyard, this is what he's trying to tell us, remember what the vineyard was like when I planted it with the best vines, right? it was clean of stones, infrastructure put in place to produce good wine. Right? Now look at it. It's in a terrible state. Right? And so let's think about you know, when, when the church was first started right, in 1830, you know, and, and the fruits that were happening, right, like, you know, we were seeing, you know, just the spirit and, and miracles like like did not exist in the world before and, and hasn't since. And, and go, now let's go over to DNC 101, verse starting with 55. And the enemy came by night and broke down the hedge. And the servants of the noblemen arose and were frightened and fled. And the enemy destroyed their works and broke down the olive trees. Right, and so uh, we get we get s some scattering, right? And like we just learned at the end of this slide, right? It, it drives the church into the wilderness. It drives them out of kind of that that vineyard, that Zion place, right? And so you know it um, it happens in the dark, which means it's in secret. Right, the enemy enters the vineyard in secret right and they break down the hedge right so what what does that hedge represent right so i'm going to show you here that it is what is the new and everlasting covenant as part of the doctrine of christ it is not the doctrine of the plurality of wives and concubines that is not the true uh, or correct new and everlasting covenant that has been taught all throughout the scriptures and even in DNC, you know, it's, 
that one exception in DNC 132 that was uh, was um, hijacked by the adversary. So doctrine comments 84, and it shall come to and it shall and they right the church shall remain under this condemnation until they repent and remember the new covenant, even the Book of Mormon. And the former cut, cut commandments, which I have given them, not only to say, but to do according to that which I have written, DNC 45.9. And even so, I have sent my everlasting covenant into the world. Right? This is way before, this is early on in the church, DNC 45. And he says he's already sent his everlasting covenant. Right? It's, it's not temple marriage. Um, to, I've sent this everlasting covenant into the world. It's the Book of Mormon, or it's what's contained in the Book of Mormon, right? To be a light to the world, to be a standard for my people and for the Gentiles, right? That, which would be, you know, we're part of the Gentiles, us in the church. For the Gentiles to seek it and to be a messenger before my face, to prepare the way before me, right? And so what we see is that in Isaiah chapter 24, verse 5, in Doctrine and Covenants, section 1, verse 15, the breaking, the prophecy that that the everlasting covenant would be broken. It would be changed, right? From offering up a broken heart and a contrite spirit and receiving the three baptisms of water, fire, and Holy Ghost to what Brigham Young inserted, right, in Doctrine and Covenants 132, verse 1, right? Being polygamy, or we call that or they called it plural marriage, and now we call it temple marriage. It's really just an evolution of the same teaching. Continuing DNC 101, verse uh, 52. Now behold, the nobleman, the lord of the vineyard, called upon his servants and said unto them, Why, what is the cause of this great evil? Ought ye not to have even as I commanded you? Right? He commanded them to go build the tower. Right? And after he had planted the vineyard and built the hedge round about and set watchmen upon the walls thereof, built the tower also and set a watchman upon the tower and watched for my vineyard and not have fallen asleep, lest the enemy should come upon you. Right? This is prophecy. This is prophecy. Right? We need to understand that, that in 1830, the Lord... Right, set up his church. Right, he set up the everlasting covenant. Right, he had servants, but they they went astray. Right, they killed Joseph Smith and they took over the vineyard. And and many who were good, right, they fell asleep. They didn't do anything about it. They let the enemy come in. They didn't fight them and push them out, right? Especially as they started teaching evil things that the Lord clearly teaches are not good, right? As something that is of God now. And over to JST Matthew 13, verse 26. But when the blade sprung up and brought forth fruit... Then appeared the tares also. So part of it could have been, right? Uh, they didn't see the bad fruits yet. They didn't see the tares, right? They were just, they were, they were yet tender. They were just springing up. You can't tell the difference yet between the wheat and the tares. So the servants of the household came to hit and said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? Whence then hath the tares? And he said unto them, An enemy has done this. And the servant said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay, lest while ye gather up the tares, ye root up the wheat with them also. Right? And um, Let both grow together until the harvest. In the time of the harvest I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together the wheat in my barn, and the tares are bound in bundles. So, right, you can't, as the as the wheat and the tares, they, they set hold into the ground, right, their roots start intertwining, and you can't pull 
the weed out or the tares out without pulling the weed out because their roots are all tied together. And so, you know, we get this sense that, you know, perhaps, you know, these could be uh, maybe this, these, the angels that are mentioned in the book of Revelation that they're like, we want to go, we want to start reaping, we want to, you know, go, um, you know, these may not be good servants on the earth. You know, they may, but, you know, we do have some ideas in Revelation that, that the angels say similar things. That they want to go destroy the, you know, go start reaping. Um, and then, ironic quote here from Brigham Young. Gadianton robbers are ready to lead astray every man and woman that wishes to be a Latter-day Saint. So, Journal of Discourses, January 20th, 1861. Uh, going back now to Isaiah, verse 5. And now go... And, and now go to, and I will tell you what I will do in my vineyard. I will take away the hedge thereof, and it shall be eaten up, and break down the wall thereof, and it shall be trodden down. So the Lord allows this hedge, right, this protection to be removed. He's allowed the true new and everlasting covenant to be replaced, right, to be removed from the church. Dr. Covenants 101, 54, And behold, the watchman upon the, the tower would have seen the enemy while he was yet afar off. Right? If we had someone who is a true prophet and seer, a true watchman, they would have seen that the enemy, right, what they were coming to do. They were going to destroy the everlasting covenant and change it. And then you could have made ready and kept the enemy from breaking down the hedge thereof and saved my vineyard from the hands of the destroyer. Right? This new and everlasting covenant that's part of the doctrine of Christ taught in the Book of Mormon is so important. He says it right it, it could have saved us if we would have you know maintained that hedge. Right? If we had you know entered into it and become uh, you know, little watchmen upon that wall, that, that wall of hedge, right? That would have saved, that would have been enough. And so the Lord calls together some of the servants and chastises them for not building the tower, etc., for allowing the enemy to enter, um, to teach us how we need to ascend, right? And that's removed from the mainstream teachings of the church. Uh, over here, cross-reference 3 Nephi chapter 2, verse 2, quote, imagining up some vain thing in their hearts that it was wrought by men and by the power of the devil to lead us away or astray and deceive the hearts of the people. And thus Satan did get possession of the hearts of the people insomuch that he did blind their eyes and lead them away to believe that the doctrine of Christ was a foolish and vain thing. Right, the prophet Moran put this in to help wake us up. This is what happened. Right? We have been blinded. We do not understand the true doctrine of Christ. Right? Um, you know, they think it's a vain thing. They think, you know, we c we can only be saved, truly saved, you know, when we, um, you know, raise our arm to the square to sustain someone who says they are a prophet, seer, and revelator, uh, when we, you know, say we're going to do all these extra add-ons, kind of like the Pharisees, um, and all these temple ordinances, right, the focus they have, they have it's kind of like a magician, right? Go focus on all the, this other stuff so that you don't see what I'm doing or not doing. Right? We have been blinded. Right? The doctrine of Christ is very simple. It doesn't require a 20-step program to be saved. 3 Nephi 16.10 
Christ prophesies the same event to the Nephites about the Latter-day Gentiles, and he says that we would reject the fullness of the gospel. Okay. You can only reject something once you've been offered it or had it. Uh, and then later in verse 13, Christ says that he will give us an opportunity to repent and return. And if we do that, we will be allowed to join the house of Israel and be able to redeem New Jerusalem with with the rest of the house of Israel. And then JST Matthew 21. Right, this is where it gets really intense here. Right? Verse 53, And the kingdom of God shall be taken from them, the Jews, and shall be given to a nation, the United States, bringing forth the fruits thereof, meaning the Gentiles. Now, that part in parentheses is actually in the scriptures. as something I added. So he's saying the kingdom of God is going to be taken from the Jews and it's going to be given to the Gentiles. You know, so in our day, last days, right, we are part of the Gentiles. We believe that we have the kingdom of God. Right? So this is directly right talking about us. Right? There's no one else that we believe has been given the kingdom of God. Wherefore, on whomsoever this stone shall fall, it shall grind him to powder. And when the Lord thereof of the vineyard cometh, he will destroy those miserable wicked men. Right? Who are these miserable wicked men? Right? They are the husbandmen who are running the vineyard. And what is Christ going to do? And and continuing, and will let again his vineyard right, again unto other husbandmen, even in the last days, who shall render him the fruits of in their seasons, right? So the fruit, remember, is that product of your your effort, right? It is um, essentially can be, be compared to right your spiritual ascension, right? Receiving the baptism of fire and the Holy Ghost, right? Having a second comforter, these fruits. Right, that uh, these new husbandmen, right, who will be now put in place, are going to help us be able to do that, because these the miserable wicked men were not doing that. Then understood they, the disciples, the parable which he spake unto them, that the Gentiles should be destroyed also. Right, they're going to be destroyed in the wine press when the Lord should descend out of heaven to reign in his vineyard, which is the earth and the inhabitants thereof. Right? And so we get this confusion in our mind. You know, in, in, in the book of Daniel, it talks about a stone cut out with mountain and how it will roll down and it will grow and it will fill the whole earth. And we say that's, that is the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Well, that's not it. that's not the correct interpretation because here Christ is telling us that the kingdom of God that is given to the Gentiles that they not only will their leaders their husbandmen are going to be destroyed but they are also the people are going to be destroyed if they don't repent and return right and so that stone that's cut out with a mountain out of the mountain that's the millennial church that's going to fill the earth that's not our church today. And so, um, let's see here. So what type of husbandmen, just to really hit this home, what type of husbandmen are running the vineyard? It is They are miserable, wicked men. Right? We won't go into why. But who is Christ going to give charge to the vineyard? To new husbandmen. Right? And so let's think about when is this supposed to happen? Well, it's going to happen in the last days, it says. Right. So after the Lord deals with bad leaders, he's going to do to the people who have been part of the kingdom of God, who won't render God fruit. Going back to Isaiah, verse 6, And I will lay, waste, I will lay it waste, the vineyard. It shall not be pruned nor digged, but there shall come upon briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that they rain, no rain upon it. 
right? And so, you know, we've learned this in the previous chapters of Isaiah, but the Lord, you know, has ab abandoned us to a degree, right? There's no servants, true servants, who are taking care of the vineyard, who are pruning it and digging around and getting rid of, you know, briars and thorns. There's no true servants, you know, it's not being taken care of. It's being neglected. There's no good fruit that's being uh, produced, right? And so due to the apostate condition of his people, they are now going to have to start enduring covenant curses, right? Which is briars and thorns, right? No rain. These are covenant curses. Verse 7, For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah his pleasant plant, right? The men of Judah, right? Those the people, they are the pleasant plant. They are the the grapes. They you know the the vine. They are the olive trees. They are the wheat, right? Same thing. And he looked for judgment, but behold, oppression, for righteousness, but behold, a cry. And so we are in, right, in a, sta a state of apostasy. And that may be a shock, right? But as we study the scriptures, right, we take the patterns, the prophecies, and we see the complete picture. How could you think otherwise? Doctrine and Covenants 124.61, right? The plants, uh, watchmen upon the walls. The Lord brings covenant curses upon his apostate people. There will be a future time that he will rescue them through select servants. Over to DNC 101.55. And the Lord of the vineyard said unto one of his servants, Go and gather together the residue of my servants, or, or whoever's left, and take all the strength of my house. Right? This is the wheat, which are my warriors, my young men, and they that are middle age, and also among all my servants, right? Um, who are the strength of my house, right? Now, this is anybody. It doesn't just mean young people. Right? This is he says all, right? All who are the strength of my house, except those only whom I have appointed to tarry or to stay. So there's going to be some people who are going to be required to stay. And go ye straightway unto the land of my vineyard and redeem my vineyard. Right? For it is mine, I have bought it with money. Therefore get ye straightway unto my land, break down the walls of my enemies, throw down their tower, and scatter their watchmen. Right? So the role of the end time servant here Right, who the Lord has now commissioned, is to gather out, one, right, the strength of the Lord's house. That's the wheat that needs to be gathered and put into the barn for safety. Two, to break down the walls of the enemy. So they've built a new wall, a new hedge, a new everlasting covenant right, that, that has taken over the vineyard. And three, to scatter their watchmen Right, and break down their towers, right? So the watchmen right, represent prophets and seers. So the enemy has supplanted true prophet and seers with false ones, with enemy watchmen who cannot, right? They cannot warn, they cannot see. And that's what Isaiah 56.10 says. It says their watchmen are altogether right, dumb. They cannot bark. They're like dumb dogs. They cannot bark. They cannot give that warning. Right? And so, you know, ironically, we have accepted our leaders that they're not going to warn us. Right? They're, you know, it's upon us. Right? If they knew what was coming, and and if they were true servants, they would be with all their effort and strength giving us warning of destruction of bondage right 
but instead they just give us soothing messages you know they've redirected us to focus on things that aren't actually going to save us that do not help us build a tower um and what are that what are the enemy's towers what what is their parallel or alternate form of ascension it's it's their it's the temples right they are building towers to the whole world and having us ascend to their towers their false towers Uh, continue DNC 10158 and in as much as they gather against you right the leaders of the church are going to be against these new servants right? Joseph Smith had a dream towards the end of his life about how he comes back to his farm and there's a barn and it's full of men right and and Joseph shows shows up and he says this is my barn and they said, "Well, you don't, you don't get it anymore. It's ours." Right? And they start fighting and, and try to kill Joseph. The leadership is not going to accept, uh, you know, in the in the least of terms, these new husbandmen. Right? Avenge me of mine enemies. Who are the enemies? Well, it's the the wicked husbandmen, the enemy watchmen. Right, who have taken over the vineyard. Continuing that by and by, may, they may come with the residue of my house and possess the land. And the servant said unto his Lord, When shall these things be? Uh, Doctrine of Covenants 10165, Therefore I must gather together my people according to the parable of the wheat and the tares, that the wheat may be secured in the garners to possess eternal life and be crowned with celestial glory when I shall come in the kingdom of my Father to reward every man according to his work shall be, while the tares shall be bound in bundles and their bands made strong, that they may be burned with unquenchable fire. Dr. Covenant 86, verse 4, But behold, in the last days, even now, while the Lord is beginning to bring forth the word, the blade is springing up and is yet tender. Behold, I verily I say unto you, the angels are crying unto the Lord night and day, who are ready and waiting to be sent forth to reap down the fields. So once again, we get this uh, indication that these servants aren't on the earth anymore. They're angels. Right? And they're asking, can we? when can we go down and reap the fields? But the Lord saith unto them, Pluck not up the tares while the blade is yet tender. For verily your faith is weak, lest you destroy the wheat also. Therefore let the wheat and the tares grow together until the harvest is ripe, fully ripe. Then you shall first gather out the wheat from among the tares. Right? This is the exodus. They're going to be physically gathered out. And after the gathering of the wheat, behold, and lo, the tares are bound in bundles and the field remaineth to be burned. Right? And so the wheat, right? they're going to exodus. They're being gathered out, and they're going to go to New Jerusalem. That is the only place of safety. And the tares are bound. right? They're going to be bound by uh, the, the modern-day king of Assyria. right? And, you know, those bounds, you know, those... Or, or corral, you might think, is being placed around us as we speak. And we just don't know it yet. We don't. Most people do not see it. They are not seeking to see it. Right? And so as soon as that gate closes, right, they are trapped. They are going to be in the system, stuck. And so now with the... Uh, we're, you know, we're going to get into the five... Uh, curses right that are going to be coming upon us right and so you know just like I was saying I don't think many of us realize that we are living in a cursed state 
right? and it's going to get worse for sure, right? Right? But it's uh, but we've been living so long under these conditions that we think it is normal, and some, and I'll say delusionally, think we are a blessed people, right? Because the church has a lot of money and we're building lots of temples, right? We are prospering, right? And that is really, you know, that's the same thing of us being frogs and we're getting used to being in a hot water, right? That is how the adversary works. He's gradually, he's been gradually desensitizing us, you know, leading us with a flax and cord, you know, down the depth, to the depths of hell, right? It's so uh, subtle. The adversary is so cunning and clever Right? You will be deceived. Everyone will be deceived unless you f understand the prophecies and put together the patterns in the scriptures. You can't trust. You can't trust men. You can't trust an institution. You got to trust the scriptures. Right? And and it's by the words of the scriptures that we will be condemned. Right? So the first woe or, or covenant curse right, is a physical famine from crop failure. So Isaiah 5 verses 8 and 9 or not 8 through 10. Woe unto them that join house to house that lay field to field till there be no place that they may be placed alone in the midst of the earth. Right, so the people are going to they're going to join up households. Right, they're going to join their fields together. Right, but the crops that are planted they're not going to yield enough to replace the seed that was planted. In my ears, said the Lord of hosts, of a truth, many houses shall be desolate, even great and fair, without inhabitant. Yea, ten acres of vineyard shall yield one bath, and the seed of a homer shall yield an ephah. So, right, this is, this is coming. You know, I believe... You know, it's my my own study that the f famine is really going to start this year in 2023, and we are going to get seven years of famine. Uh, so that would put us up to 2030. It is going to be part of the great tribulation that we will have to go through. Now, the righteous, right? They will be delivered in a shorter amount of time, right? Because otherwise they won't survive it, and what that means doesn't mean is that they're gonna only have to go through six months of it, right? But if you take the, you know, the entire time, the elect will have it shor a shorter time. And I hope to do a little video t to expound on that a little bit more, especially uh, like in the Book of Revelation, chapter two. But really, that is part of what is what is given to one of the churches about uh, they'll, they'll have 10 days of, of tribulation which is really 10 years right that that's that great tribulation that we come out of right 10 days of tribulation that's or a short time that's right that's not a great tribulation 10 years yes and that started in 2020 that's my personal belief um, and, and now we are three years into this captivity, right? We had quarantine through the whole world. And now we are, um, you know, in 2023, we're three years into it. And now the famine, seven-year famine is going to start. And that's going to take us to 2030. Curse number two, right? Woe unto them that rise up early in the morning, that they may follow strong drink that continue until night, till wine inflame them. So the Lord's people in the latter days are not drinkers. Right? Right? We condemn alcohol. So what does this really mean? For behold, all ye that doeth iniquity, stay yourselves and wonder. For ye shall cry out and cry, and ye shall be drunken, but not with wine. Ye shall stagger, but not with strong drink. They will be drunken with iniquity in all manner of abominations. Second Nephi 27. 
they go after liquor of comfortable lives and traditions of their fathers, which is generational iniquity. They choose to believe an illusion, right? This drink, instead of the uncomfortable truths. They refuse to wake up and arise spiritually, whereas those who are wheat, right, it is expedient, quote, it is expedient that I should awaken you from an awful reality of these things, Second Nephi 9.47, and awake and arise from the dust, O Jerusalem, yea, put on thy beautiful garments, O daughter of Zion, Moroni 10.31. Uh, going back to Isaiah, verse 12, And the harp, and the vial, and the tabret, and the pipe, and the wine are in their feasts. But they regard not the work of the Lord, neither consider the operation of his hands. So people will continue on with their everyday lives, thinking that all they need to do is be a good person, right? instead of learning and hearkening to what the Lord has forewarned them of in the scriptures. They give God lip service, but their hearts are actually far from him. And they don't have a close relationship with God. And they don't understand God's ways or his paths, which is the doctrine of Christ. They don't understand that. They don't realize just how off they've left that straight and narrow path, and they are on a strange path. You know, they have, uh, you know, going off you know, towards the great and spacious building. Verse 7, Yea, and there shall be many which shall say, Eat, drink, and be merry. Right? For tomorrow we die, and it shall be well with us. Now, this is from Second Nephi 28. If you haven't watched my video specifically on this chapter, right? just understand that in, I think it was verse 2 of this chapter, verses 1 or 2, it tells us that this chapter is addressed to those who hold the Book of Mormon of as to great worth. He's talking to the Latter-day Saints. This isn't talking about other people, although it may apply. This is directly for us. And there shall be also be many which shall say, Eat, drink, and be merry. Nevertheless, fear God. He will justify committing a little sin. Yea, lie a little, take advantage of one because of his words. Dig a pit for thy neighbor. There is no harm in this. And do all these things, for tomorrow we die. And, and if it so be that we are guilty, God will beat us with a few, few stripes, and at last we shall be saved in the kingdom of God. Right? I know so many people in my own circles who refuse to be aware of what's going around them. They just want to enjoy their life they don't want to worry about the problems right that are happening right because it makes them depressed right? right we are being blinded right the gates are being closed around us and we are like sheep who are following a false shepherd who is who's going to lead us into bondage. Continuing with the curse too, wherefore my people are gone into captivity, just like I said, because they have no knowledge. They don't really know how to ascend. They think it's in the temple. Right? They think by these outward ordinances and performances, that's how you get saved. They don't understand the doctrine of Christ. And their honorable men are famished. And their multitude dried up with thirst. Right? Um, right? They, they are f having a famine of the word of God. Right? They're famished. They're not getting meat. You know, they are at best living off of skin milk. Second Nephi 32.7, And now I, Nephi, cannot say more. The Spirit stoppeth mine utterance, and I am left to mourn because of the unbelief and the wickedness and the ignorance and the stiff-neckedness of men, for they will not search knowledge. 
nor understand great knowledge when it is given to them in plainness, even as plain as word can be. This is the scriptures. They will not search the scriptures. They just will, li will listen for their leaders to tell them what to do. The Lord has provided his, his people with the information they need to survive the day of judgment, both physically and spiritually, but they will not search it. Right? They rely on false leaders to tell them, and they're not. The leaders are not going to tell them. Right? Isaiah 56.10, I mentioned this. His watchmen are blind. They are all ignorant. They are all dumb dogs. They cannot bark. Sleeping, lying down, loving to slumber. They were asleep. If something is different from the, what the church leaders teach, right? If, you know, if the leaders are teaching something different than the scriptures. They believe it, right? Um, and it could be evil, right? And that's one of the one of the themes in the Book of Mormon, right? Is that the people are led to believe that evil things are good, and that good things, even the doctrine of Christ, is evil, right? Uh, because the doctrine of Christ teaches you, right, that, you know, in the Book of Mormon as well, right, all throughout, the people always want a king. But God wants us to come to him. And the people believe that if they are temple worthy, they will receive their exaltation. As long as they don't mess up too much, right, God will just beat them with a few stripes, and but then they will be let in. Right? Is that what we just read? God will beat us with a few stripes, and at last we shall be saved in the kingdom of God. Uh, woe unto you, ye blind guides, which say, Whosoever shall swear by the temple, it is nothing. But whosoever shall swear by the gold of the temple, he is a debtor. Matthew 23. Helaman. 13.29, O ye wicked, perverse generation, ye hardened and ye stiff-necked people, how long will ye suppose that the Lord will suffer you? Yet how long will ye suffer yourselves to be led by foolish and blind guides? Yet how long will, will ye choose darkness or evil rather than light or good? Matthew 15.14, Let them alone, they be blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind lead the blind, both shall fall into the ditch. So there's a famine, right, of hearing the words of the Lord. What we're getting is not s s spiritually sustaining us, you know. And that's Amos 8, 11, and 13. You know, one cannot ad adequately ascend with what we are being taught. And so we are not... Uh, producing the fruit that God wants us to produce. And so as a result, we are in spiritual captivity, and this is going to precede their physical captivity. Uh, continuing with uh, Covenant Curse 2, it's a long one. The others are much shorter. Verse 14 of Isaiah 5, Therefore hell hath enlarged herself, and opened her mouth without measure, and their glory, and their multitude, and their pomp, and he that rejoiceth shall descend into it. And so, thus the devil cheateth their souls, leadeth them way carefully down to hell. Second Nephi 20:21, 20, and First Nephi 14:5. And it shall come to pass that the angel spake unto me, Nephi, saying, Thou hast beheld that if the Gentiles repent, it shall be well with them. And thou also knowest concerning the covenants of the Lord of the house of Israel. Right, the new and everlasting covenant. And thou also hast heard that whoso repenteth not must perish. If you don't change your ways, right? That's repenting, changing, turning back to the Lord, because you're not uh, going towards the Lord. Therefore, woe be unto the Gentiles, if it so be that they harden their hearts against the Lamb of God. For the time cometh, saith the Lamb of God, that I will work a great and marvelous work among the children of men, a work which shall be everlasting either on the one hand or on the other, either to the convincing of them 
unto peace and eternal life, or unto the deliverance of them to the hardness of their hearts and the blindness of their minds, unto, unto their being brought down into captivity and also into their destruction, both temporally and spiritually, according to the captivity of the devil, of which I have spoken. And the mean man shall... Be, um, so, right, it's, it's our choice, right? We've been given the words, and, you know, we can either be convinced and to believe in the Holy Scriptures, right, and be delivered, or we can um, continue to harden our hearts, right, to continue to be blind, to not want to look, and, you know, and be in spiritual and eventually physical captivity. Uh, verse 15 of Isaiah, And the mean man shall be brought down, and the mighty man shall be humbled, and the eyes of the lofty shall be humbled, but the Lord of hosts shall be exalted in judgment. And God that is holy shall be sanctified in righteousness. So this is reiteration from Isaiah back in chapter 2, verses 9 through 11, that emphasizes how the wicked and elite will be brought low through covenant curses, and, and you know, as they're intended to do, right? They're they're meant. These curses are meant to humble us. So this is the first time we also see the term righteousness, and we'll see this throughout Isaiah, and it is an important signifier and metaphor for the Lord's end time servant. So over in Isaiah 41:2, who hath raised up the righteous man from the east? called him to his foot, gave the nations before him, and made him rule over kings. In Isaiah 45, 13, I have raised him up in righteousness, and I will direct all his ways. He shall build my city, New Jerusalem, and he shall let go my captives, not for price nor reward. Right? These people are going to be getting captive. Isaiah 17 Verse 17, Then shall the lambs feed after their manner, and the waste places of the fat ones shall strangers eat. So after the end time servant comes, then the Lord reminds his elect, his sheep, right, the lambs, of the promised blessings they will receive for remaining true and faithful. Right? Including Zion, right, inheritance in Zion, and that's going to be built upon waste places where strangers, right, those who were not of the covenant, resided. And a bunch of references you can go look at there. All right, now uh, we're on to uh, curse number three. Um, it's only this slide, so sh much shorter. Um, so upon those in sin who do not trust, there's a curse upon those in, in sin who do not trust God. So verse 18, woe unto them that draw iniquity with cords of vanity, and sin, as it were, with a cart rope. So vanity are things that keep you preoccupied, you know, those, and it's those who are prioritizing vanity over God will be cursed. That say, let him make speed and hasten his work that we may see it, and let count the counsel of the Holy One of Israel draw nigh and come that we may know it. People want proof of the signs of the second coming. Yet they don't believe or try to understand the ones already given them in the scriptures. They won't seek them. Uh, 35, chapter 2, verse 1, And it came to pass that thus passed away the 95th year, and the people began to forget those signs and wonders which they had heard, and began to be less and less astonished at, the sign, at a sign or a wonder from heaven, insomuch that they began to be hard in their hearts and blind in their minds, and began to disbelieve all they had heard and seen. Right? They are, you know, they're going to reject. Yeah, they reject everything you tell them. You know, you t you tell them as as clear as word can be, but it just doesn't sink in. They're blind. They don't see it. Right? They don't. He they can't hear what the truth is. Second Nephi 32, 7, And now I, Nephi, cannot say more. The Spirit stops my utterance, and I am left to mourn because of unbelief and wickedness. Right? 
and ignorance of negligent men, for they will not search knowledge nor understand great knowledge when it is given to them in plainness, even as plain as the word can be. Second Nephi thirty three two. But behold, there are many that harden their hearts against the Holy Spirit that hath no place in them, wherefore they cast many things away which are written, and esteem them as things of not of nothing. Right? But I Nephi have written unto what I have written, and I esteem it of great worth, especially unto my people, for I pray continually for them by day, and my eyes water my pillow by night because of them, and I cry unto God in faith, and I know that he will hear my cry. Right? This is evidence that the people are bec are, be are are bec have become terrors. They have hardened. They are blind. They, they do not see. They will not seek. We cannot be saved in ignorance. Curse number four is unto those who can't discern evil from good. Verse 20, Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe unto them that are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. And so as scriptures become mingled with the precepts of men, right, people mistake evil for good. The king of Assyria represents darkness, right, and he has a false philosophy that he promotes. Many will be deceived and accept that ideology. Moroni teaches us, right, uh, Latter-day Covenant people, that knowing evil from good is as easy as discerning the night from the day. It's that easy. It's, right, it, we must not try to justify evil practices such as polygamy as good. Like teaching that it is bad, except when church leaders tell you it is good. But that's mixing the scriptures with the precepts of men. As Isaiah has been telling us and will continue to emphasize, our leaders are leading us astray. Right? And this should be obvious to anyone with the light of Christ. It is not a trick question about what is good and what is not. Right? And that's found in Moroni chapter 7. I may do a video on the entire chapter because it is very pertinent to us right, that we accept the word of God, that we believe, and that it is obvious when something looks, it smells, right, it feels evil, it's evil, it's obvious. Second Nephi 28.15, O the wise, the learned, the rich that are puffed up in the pride of their hearts, and all those who preach false doctrines. Right, Second Nephi 28, this is to us, Latter-day Saints. All those who commit whoredoms and pervert the right way of the Lord, woe, woe, woe be unto them, saith the Lord God Almighty, for they shall be thrust down to hell. It's not looking good. Woe unto them that turn aside right, the just for a thing of naught, and revile against that which is good, and say it is of no worth. Right? Right? The doctrine of Christ, right, that's too simple. It's not worth, it has no worth, it's, it can't save you. You have to get your temple recommend, right? For the day shall come that the Lord God will speedily visit the inhabitants of the earth, and in the day that they shall are fully ripe in iniquity, they shall perish. Second Nephi 9.28, oh, the cunning plan of the evil one. And just as I said, he, the adversary, is very cunning. You will be deceived. Right, unless you turn to the word of God. Oh, the vainness, the frailties, the foolishness of men. When they are learned, they think they are wise, and they hearken not unto the counsel of God, for they set it aside, supposing that they know of themselves. They set aside the word of God, thinking that they or their leaders know. Wherefore, their wisdom is foolishness, and it profiteth them not and they shall perish. But to be learned is good if they hearken unto the counsels of God. And whoso knocketh, to him will he open in the wise and the learned, and they that are rich, who are puffed up because of their learning, right? spiritual learning, we can say, you know, or, you know, or secular even, and their wisdom and their riches, 
Yea, they are they who, whom he despiseth. And save they shall cast these things away, and consider themselves fools before God, and come down in the depths of humility, he will not open unto them. Right? Think about the, the foolish virgins. He would not open the door for them, like, would not let them in. And finally, curse number five here is unto the leaders who prevent righteousness. Now, as you can hopefully start to see, you know, how the leaders might be doing this. Verse 22, Woe unto them that are mighty to drink wine, and men of strength to mingle strong drink. So those who are drunk can't see, can't think clearly, their judgment is impaired. Right? They think all is well in Zion, even while being under covenant curses. Right? Uh, Isaiah 28, verse 1, Woe unto the crown of pride, to the drunkards of Ephraim. Right? Who in the last days, by and large, is the tribe of Ephraim? Who is this talking to? Who does Christ want us to understand this is talking to and, and will happen again? Whose glorious beauty is a fading flower, which are on the head of the fat valleys of them that are overcome with wine. But they also have erred through wine and through strong drink are out of the way. And priests and the prophet have erred through strong drink. They are swallowed up in wine. They are out of the way through strong drink. They err in vision. They stumble in judgment. Verse 23 of Isaiah, which justify the wicked for reward and take away the righteousness of the righteous from him. These mighty and strong leaders have justified their wickedness as a reward, and they impede those people who would follow the path of righteousness. Verse 24, And therefore, as the fire devoureth the stubble, and the flame consumeth the chaff, so their root shall be as rottenness, and their blossom shall go up as dust, because they have cast away the law of the Lord of hosts, and despised the word of the Holy One of Israel. Right? And so the ancestral roots of a people right, will show to have been rotten, Right, you know, our fathers and fathers and right, they didn't produce fruit. Right? What they were doing by teaching and accepting abominations and teaching lies and so on and many other worse things, those things will be announced and are being announced on the housetops, and we will see that they are rotten. And that that blossom, that fruit, right, is just gonna. Right, it's going to be burned to ash, to dust, right, from the king of Assyria. And, and it's for those who despised or cast the scriptures away, right, that word, the word of the Holy One of Israel, right, because they cast away the law and they despise the scriptures from from their daily life. And lastly, here. As a continuation of curse 5, starting verse 25, Therefore is the anger of the Lord kindled against his people, and he hath stretched forth his hand against them, and hath smitten them, and the hills did tremble, right? hills being the small nations, and their carcasses were torn in the midst of the streets. For all this his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. So the anger of the hand are metaphors for the king of Assyria, who the Lord uses to punish and destroy. So perhaps as a symbol of evil king's appearance, the Lord draws back his hand, and when he strikes, earthquakes happen, right? His hand is still raised because he is not done yet. We can see more of that in D&C 45, verses 30 to 35, 26. And he will lift up an ensign, to the nations from afar. An ensign, this is a person. This is the end time servant. And and he is in, uh, you know, and he works as the Lord's other hand, right? Um, 
but in this case here, right, an enzyme, the Lord uses almost the same metaphors for the end time servant and the king of Assyria. Right? And and so one of this as we look at this here, right, we can see who he is talking about. Right. And so this this is in this case it's going to be the king of Assyria. Right. He comes from a nation far away from his own, and he has an alliance of nations that will follow his command and destroy the world. Right? Verse twenty seven, none shall be weary nor stumble among them, none shall slumber nor sleep, neither shall the girdle of their loins be loosed nor the latchet of their shoes be broken. These are the armies of this enzyme. Right? Now this is a bad enzyme. Right? This isn't the enzyme we should follow, but this is the enzyme that most people are going to be. Whose arrows are sharp, and their bows bent, and the horse hooves count like flint, and none shall be able to stop these, right? Their roaring shall be like a lion. Um, so anciently, you know, they would displace their